Welcome to this edition of When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine, a discussion of sustainable living and what that means to you and me. I'm Jay Warmke. And I'm Annie Warmke. And today we're going to talk about Raising Healthy Goats Part 3, or High on the Hill Was the Lonely Goat Herd. <laughs> All right, everybody. Please yodly, don't yodly, yodly, yodly. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I knew that was going to be uh, well received. I was so. very worried uh, about how that was coming out. So, okay, so that is the topic today: raising Which healthy goats. Which yodeling or raising healthy goats? I don't know. If you don't have enough to fill it all, go into a second course. <laughs> okay, so let's let's talk about raising goats. Um, for those folks who are interested in such things, like the lonely goat herd, um, tell me a little bit about the basic basic humane care. Of goats because we we hear so much about livestock today as a commodity, um, and I think people forget that these are living, breathing beasts, right? I'm not sure we even know it. I think you know when people um, have animals in their life, it could be a mouse that they have in a cage, or it could be a I don't know, an elephant in the backyard, but it's like I don't know the people you know, okay, <laughs> with their <laughs> elephant in the back. Let's well, I see this stuff mm-hmm. online, okay, okay so right, just to right. say that people, we we are a, a culture of um, of animals in our lives. So it could be personal pets. It could be livestock that we raise for food. It, it could be any kind of situation. But I, I feel there's a difference between a pet and livestock. Okay, if you Culture. go online and you look at some of these sites that look at inhumane treatment, you will mm-hmm. see that there's very little difference, that many, many animals being abandoned, they aren't being neutered. They. Oh, I know you can be inhumane to an animal for sure, but I, I guess for some reason in my mind, there is a distinction between a pet and there is a distinction between livestock. I mean, people do consume meat and people okay, do— Okay, but some cultures eat— Dogs and cats, too. And that so doesn't bother I, me so much. I either. think when we put something into a category and we mm-hmm. say that category is okay, and so we're going to protect that one, but that category, like in livestock, it doesn't matter as much. I think it's wrong. So that's why the word humane, why I like to use the word humane, because in order for an animal, and particularly we're talking about goats today, um, to receive humane care. There are just a few basic things, but they're very powerful. And one is that we are responsible for their health, to create an environment that promotes health. And we're responsible for helping them to fight off disease and parasites. And again, that is almost always environment. We have to provide them with daily ration of food that is unique to their own nutrition level and their own lifestyle. And then also, we also need to consider not only the diet, but vitamins and mineral requirements, and that all contributes to their health. So goats are unique in terms of the requirements that they have. Uh, They need to be provided with feed or forage, and forage really is not eating grass. It is eating a lot of broadleafy plants, um, things like honeysuckle and what we call brambles, so raspberries and different thorny plants. They like to eat um, bark off of trees so and leaves. Um, so they're really foragers, and they eat a little of this and a little of that, and they need that high fiber in order for the rumen, which is the um, what they call the stomach chambers, to function uh, appropriately. And so they need to have the right quantity of food and the right type of food and the right um, uh, kind of food. They also need to be able to live in the right conditions. So goats don't like to be where uh, they're getting wet or snowed on. They don't like to be in a draft when it's cold outside. So they need voluntary access to pasture and outside uh, exercise, but they also need shelter that protects them. Um, So things like that. They also need to have hay and maybe silage that is protected from rodents and other animals. And this is really humane because they won't eat feed that's dirty. Well, Um, and I've also noticed they're pretty... I mean, goats are pretty prissy, as you're describing them. You know, they don't want to go out and get wet. They don't want this. They're they're very they're very fussy, and that's the opposite of what a lot of the character 
caricature of a goat. Yeah. But they also waste a lot of their a lot of their feed. Well, I think they don't waste feed that tastes really super good. And so maybe the quality of hay doesn't have so most of the time, a, a goat should be fed the first cutting of a hay field, and that's where all the flower heads and the seed heads are. So the less that material is in that hay, the less they're going to eat of it. And, and isn't the first cutting usually considered the less quality for, for horse people and cattle right, but, people? Right, but they have a different stomach and, and Yeah, because you're getting all the junk. You're clearing out all the right. junk and just letting the grass for the second and third cuttings. Right. But, but horses are hay animals. They're not yeah, yeah, forage yeah. animals. No, so this is good for goat uh, yeah. herders. You can get the cheap stuff, you know. Yeah, well, but if if you're really thinking about it, it's not the cheap stuff because it's really nutritional. And so mm-hmm. the less nutrition that's in it, then the, le- then the more they're going to waste. Um, and so also when we look at kids, goat kids, we know that they shouldn't be weaned before six weeks. So they're getting milk, whether hopefully it's their their mother's milk or their dam's milk, um, but it could be some kind of supplement. And they also need to be offered dry uh, feed such as hay at about two weeks of age, but you would hope they start nibbling on it right away. So those are some things about the basics of humane care. Well, and I was going to, it just reminded me when you're talking about getting mother's milk right at the beginning, I wasn't aware until I started hanging around you when you were raising goats, the importance of colostrum and getting that first bit of milk. When, well, they must have that. Yeah, but I, I think in a lot of the ways that animals are raised, they don't get that. Okay, so so that first milk, and there's different people will have different views on this, but um, in that first 24 to 48 hours of that animal's life, they need to have the milk that the dam is producing, and that has what's called colostrum. And that has um, the ability to give that new baby all of the... Um, immunity to disease and um, different problems uh, that the mother has. So if so, you can buy colostrum substitute or you could offer colostrum from another breed of an animal that produces milk like a cow. But either way, what we're really saying is we need to understand how this animal operates and in order to be humane, we need to take care of it properly. And that could be said of a dog or a cat. Most people try to take good care of those things, but they may not know very much about the health of a dog or a cat. And so they do things that are inhumane, um, but in a benevolent way, and it's too bad. So with goats, we don't want to be the exception. We've made an investment in this animal emotionally and financially, and so let's be humane. And if we, if you have questions about that, there are all kinds of groups online um, that uh, will tell you all about what to do with um, to to uh, connect with different. <laughs> I don't know why I'm struggling with words, but so just look up humane care, <laughs> livestock humane care. Well, you're talking about humane care as a concept, but then there are also various certification programs that That's attest right. to the fact that you are, in fact, yeah, is a standard. Doing things. Right. So, so what are some of those? Um, um, well, there's uh, the um, uh, Humane Society, the American Humane Society, and you can go on their website, the ASPCA.org. Uh, and they will, for each species of animal, show you humane uh, strategy for um, each animal, bison all the way down to goats, chickens, um, whatever. And then also there are local um, statewide uh, organic farm groups that do certifications. They don't always include humane treatment, but I think some of them do. And um, and then there's a group called FACT, F-A-C-T. Uh, dot org that um, has some certifications that are a lot more basic than the ASPCA. And I think uh, you had raised about these humane for that species because I, I think a lot of people make the mistake of humanizing the animals and thinking something that they would like would also be good for the animal, and that's not always the case. I'm, I'm thinking specifically like with when we were raising llamas, and people think because they have all of this wool, they're going to be hot in the summertime. And as a result, there were actually laws that said you had to shave them. Right. Um, and yet our experience, while well, llamas don't cool themselves 
like humans, they deal from their bellies and the bottoms of their feet. So well, they actually, don't have any wool. Just yeah, to yeah, say. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and naturally, naturally, <laughs> yeah. they don't. Um, but by shaving them, you expose their skin to all sorts of parasites and mm-hmm. and bugs and biting animals. And so, so in order to be humane, because they look hot, you're actually making them more miserable. Um, I'm not sure it's even that they look hot. I think it's more that they want a show animal and so the show animal people are controlling the rules so oh, well so i was being kind I that, thought, that's you know. a good example though mm-hmm. so another part of being humane has to do with that herd manager that goat owner that person who's going to be in charge of taking care of the goats and there are a lot of good books out there in fact i have a brand new book called the business of goat herding and it's going to be on sale starting tomorrow and so hey (laughs) go for it shameless Shameless plug i don't care Mm -hmm. but there are lots of podcasts and we do have a podcast series that we're producing right now and this is one part of it but youtube videos webinars all kinds of things a, a, a plethora of information out there and lots and lots of goat books and not one single one of them is all that great except of course mine is super Mm -hmm. good well that goes without saying yes but so what i want to talk about is a a little bit about the basics of uh, planning and awareness for herd managers because uh it is ignorance it is ignorance that causes so much of the bad things that happen in the livestock world so kidding, having an, a, a, if you're going to have an animal reproduce on your farm or in your life, you really need to know what are some of the problems that can happen. I've seen photos online uh, where people will say, this goat's been in labor for seven hours and it's been like this for five hours and it has a leg sticking out. This animal is in so much pain and the kid is dead and it's totally out of ignorance. So we need to have information and understand what to do when we need to give colostrum, how to avoid problems with bad goat mothers because they do exist, uh, and what we're going to do about it, and then what is appropriate care for the newborn kid. Uh, injections. How do we give injections? Um, unfortunately, in this country, in rural areas, the vets are not very knowledgeable or at all knowledgeable about goats. So we need to be somewhat a veterinarian um, in terms of our care for uh, for goats. Well, and I've also seen that with the vets, oftentimes the charges that they have for very simple routines are three or four times the value of the animal. It just doesn't make any sense to you know, pay $300 to treat a $50 goat. Well, or the other thing is to load that animal up into a vehicle and they're already sick or injured and so you're adding to the stress and you could actually kill the animal um, from the stress. So so learning some of the basics of how to care for that animal, um, it just makes you a better herd manager and more confident and also more connected with that animal uh, psychologically so when something goes wrong, you know. Learning how to do drenching. In the goat world, that really basically says that you're going to get liquid down that animal's throat for some reason or another and how to do that, where to put that um, syringe or whatever you're using, uh, where to put that in the mouth and down the throat so it goes to the right um, room. And so you can't be shy with working with or timid with these animals. No, but unfortunately, lots of people are not confident, and that's what the challenge is. Also, dehorning, and this is quite a con- uh, controversial issue in the world of goats because um, go- goats have horns. Almost all goats will have horns. And horns, uh, if you study this issue, you'll see that the horns are really important to that animal for sometimes protection. They contain hormones and minerals. They help the animal to heat and cool itself naturally and also to scratch itself and break up bales of hay and all kinds of things. So understanding how you feel about that and then if you do plan to dehorn, finding a humane way, which I believe would be to use um, a veterinarian. And well, to I, I noticed when you stopped debudding or dehorning the goats, um, they they seem to put on weight faster and 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 just generally appear healthier. Well, part of the challenge is when we were disbudding them that um, it really sets them back because it's, it's a, a bit brutal. Traumatic. It's not mm-hmm. a bit. It's brutal. It goes all the way. It burns all the way to the skull, and sometimes if the vet makes a mistake. 
there'll be a fever, and it's just a really, really traumatic thing for the animal. Well, speaking of trauma, you're listening to When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine with Jay and Annie Warmke, reminding you that it is indeed the end of the world as we know it. And thank God. Thank God. So today we're actually speaking about goats, being a goat herder, the business of goats, with the number one expert on goats, <laughs> Annie. Annie, so Annie the goat whisperer. So so you were just talking about the role of a goat herder, a goat herd manager. A goat um, herd manager? A, a goat herd manager. Okay. Mm-hmm. I've term. aspired to that. Uh-huh. So, so carry on. Well, I just want to say I, I don't think I'm exactly an expert. I Goats remi- remind me almost daily how little I do know about them. But I find them to be incredibly um, intriguing and uh, inspiring, and I, I like being a goat herder an awfully lot. So the next thing I want to talk about is castration because um, when you have um, – when you have male animals, then you have to think about, is this a male animal that we're going to utilize for uh, um, reproduction? And in the goat world, there are too many males. So what we do is say, look, we don't care how good um, that goat looks. Uh, he doesn't really have much of a chance to be a, a buck for another herd. So we're going to uh, band him, which is um, a process of putting a, a really sturdy rubber band with a special tool uh, up against the um, top of the scrotum, which is the sacs for the um, testicles. And um, it doesn't hurt them. It just squeezes off the blood supply. And then uh, we keep track of what's going on in that area to make sure there's nothing um, wrong. And over time, it takes maybe four to six weeks for the sac to um, dry up and fall off. And then we have what's called a weather. And he has a great chance of living beyond just being a butchered animal because then he can be trained to do things like haul a pack so he could go hiking with somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, He can be trained to work with kids. We've had several people come and buy goats uh, because we have a good reputation for the temperament of our goats. And you spoil them rotten. Mm, I don't think I spoil them, (laughs) but I have a lot of respect for them and I like to be with them and um, they each have a respected name, so they're not called some weird raspberry name. Um, they're, they have the first letter of their mother's name. So Grace's uh, daughter this time uh, round was named Guinea, and, um, and then her son is named George. So what, what we're basically doing is saying, well, look. Well, let me, you brushed over that, but one of the reasons you do that is to keep track of who is related to whom, so that if you um, then when you go to breed them again, you want to you want to keep the genetics mixed up pretty, pretty nicely. Well, that's a, a good point in that we, we try to keep good records so we know who's bred with whom and what the outcome of that was. And every good goat herder should be keeping um, as good as possible. I mean, I'm not the best record keeper, but I do know who's begat who and what things have gone wrong and what things have gone right. Well, one of the reasons why we're incorporating this, other than the fact that we do raise goats, is when you talk about sustainability, goats are are a great animal for the small homesteader. I mean, essentially, they take up less um, less land. They do less damage to the land than, say, cattle, providing dairy products, providing meat, if that's what you're raising them for. So I, I think I'm trying to draw this back a little bit to say for for a sustainable animal – uh, to raise his livestock, goats are goats are pretty much right up there at the top of the list. And their poo is very um, evenly balanced in the uh, potassium, phosphorus, and nitrogen. It's what we all want: is balanced poo. Okay, well, that's another show, Jay. Let's right. stick with this one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh, where do we go from here? So mm-hmm. anyway, in terms of the weathers. Uh, we want to have an animal that is really sweet. And weathers, uh, once they um, are castrated, as the vet told me once, they think about grass, not ass. And they are so sweet and so uh, adoring of humans for the most part. So then the other thing would we come to is milk procedures, milking procedures. And if you're going to milk an animal, how's that all going to happen? And how are you safely going to Uh, put that animal on a stand and how are you going to handle the milk and what will you do with the milk and what will you do when you have too much 
Um, again, this is all about humane care, and it's very much connected to sustainability because if I don't have these things sorted out for these animals that are in my life, um, I'm wasting their potential, I'm wasting resources, and I am not, um, I'm not being honoring of the gifts of these animals that they bring to our culture and our life. Well, it strikes me that goats are creatures of habit as well, and part of the humanity of it is is giving them a, a daily routine that they can come to rely on. Well, that's the consistency of it, but also it's saying, look, they have a job to do. I have a job to do, and I need to do my job and then step out of the way. And one of the jobs, the main job, is to make sure they're safe and they have what they need to do their job. And as the herd manager... I'm responsible to make that happen, and too many times I see that's not the case. And you keep referring to it as the herd manager. Um, these are herd animals, and they're looking for a leader. And, and what I've heard you say many times is you are the head of the herd. They have to respect the fact that you're the boss. That's right. And they do have a goat head of the herd called the queen, and they know that's what she is. But I would say in my herd, this has always surprised me, uh, most of the time, I don't have a, a real goat head of the herd. Um, I might have one that's more bossy, but I do think they lean on me to be really the head of the herd um, and accept that that's the role that I play. Well, one of the goals of humane treatment, aside from just you know fulfilling your half of the compact with this herd, is to to the end result is a healthy animal. So how are you going to be recognizing when your goats are healthy and when your goats are sick? Well, we can talk about that in a minute, but I would like to finish talking about the different lists because that the, the next part, which fits into what you just said, is hoof trimming and maintenance. So if you're wanting to find a healthy goat, the first thing you're going to do is look at those feet and see how those hooves have been trimmed. And sometimes you'll see they're peeling a little bit, so that might tell you. Uh, like I have a goat right now that has a little bit of peeling on her horns, on her um, hoofs. And I, I know that this is a copper deficiency. And also we've had horrible wet weather, uh, really horrible for so long. And this is hard on them. So if you don't take care of their hooves, you're not going to have a healthy animal, especially in the environment we've had this year with too much moisture. The next thing is euthanasia. How are you going to have a deal with an animal that has to be put down? You have to have figured this out. It's the most horrendous thing to go through when an animal is dying and you haven't thought through what to do about it. Super, super important. Especially when you've come, you know, you've created a relationship with this animal. It's it's not exactly a pet, but it's a friend, you know. I mean... Um, well, you're workers together. Mm -hmm. So, And if you have livestock, you will have dead stock. Mm -hmm. And that is just the reality of it. And it's important to accept that this is how it goes and what will you do? What is your process for dealing with it? Who are the people you can call up and ask for some guidance? Where can you go on Facebook or other social media sites? Who is your vet that you can call on? What supplies do you have that can help you with um, these issues? Do you have a weapon? Um, are you prepared to you know, uh, slice its throat or shoot it or maybe take the exhaust from the car. And this is the considered the humane way to kill an animal is to take the exhaust with a pipe and give it carbon monoxide that poisoning. That sounds a little bit difficult to get the car out into the barnyard. I don't think you, you run a tube. But the other <laughs> thing would be that you would need to give under the guidance of the rules for humane treatment – if you were going to shoot it or cut its throat, you would need to give it an anesthetic of mm -hmm. some sort so that it doesn't know what's happening. Okay. Well, already now I understand why I'm not the goat herder because I could not do any of those things. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing, though, is that's the that's in the same line as slaughtering. as mm -hmm. you know, what I are, couldn't do that either. Yeah. So well, and so I would again. I'd rather be a hypocrite. You're going to have so. too many goats. You're going to have too many right. chickens. Whatever it is, you're going to have too many of. And they're mostly going to be the boys. You don't need those males. So what to do about it? And that's the paradox of, of raising livestock that we've always, because I think so many people who get into sustainability and homesteading think of the one part of it, sort of the idyllic, I have these animals prancing around in the field and I'm growing my own tomatoes and everything's wonderful. They don't realize that there is death and killing and all these other things that 
Oh, go it's hand a cycle hand. of life. We're right. so we're so removed from it. The other thing is, and we're talking about that, is emergency preparedness. So having things sorted. So what do you do when there's an emergency? And how do you deal with that? Um, recognizing signs of what is normal behavior, what is health, what is abnormal behavior, what's pain, what's fear. Um, and really, I recommend that every day you spend some moments with every single animal watching them walk uh, I like to feed, we have barrels that are attached to fence posts and, and we fill those barrels with hay. And part of the reason we do that is because they goats shouldn't be eating on the ground. But the other part is I want to see them in this bad weather when it's cold and rainy, I want to see them walk from the barnyard to those barrels. Um, and an example would be recently we had a young goat, um, a spring kid uh, that um, ha- obviously had meningeal worm and this is often fatal. And it's only because I saw her stumble, one time stumble, walking to that barrel. And I brought her into the milk room, and it was clear to me what was wrong. And she was disoriented. She was dragging her leg. And this all happened within a 24-hour period. So it's part of the herd manager has got to be to observe. And I run my hand across every animal every day. Um, And also then just the idea of understanding, uh, having a knowledge of body condition scoring. Um, This is, it's called F-A-M-A-C-H-A, and you can look it up online. And it will give you all the details of how to look at an animal and score it according to the color of the inside of their eyelid and also by the bone structure that's evident in the animal. Again, these are all really important things that we have to know. And we can not we can just start out and buy an animal and um, just pretend that we can just muddle through. But uh, a lot of time we're going to have a dead animal. Mm-hmm. I know you get a lot of calls from people who are raising goats. And it always amazes me how ill-prepared people are to deal with these animals. They They have this sense that... You buy a goat or you buy any livestock, you put it out in the or field. Or a dog or a cat. Yeah, and then magically they seem to take care of themselves. And uh, then, I don't know, I guess they're there just for scenery and backdrop. It's hard to say. I don't know what people are thinking. I think we're so far removed from realities. But one of the, the other part about humane treatment is what do we do with an animal who's sick or dying? Um, So we need to have a plan for that. And part of that plan needs to be, first of all, when you see something's wrong, is to separate that animal and from the rest of the herd. And um, part of the challenge of that is that goats are prey animals, and so they're very fearful and stressed if they don't have the ability to see the rest of the herd. Uh, Sometimes we'll separate, with, if it's a young kid, with the mother or the sibling. Um, but we have our, uh, all of our uh, situation in the barnyard so that, that goats can see each other if they have to be separated. So these are all really important factors that go into um, how to have humane treatment, but also how to have uh, a lot better chance, a lot better percentage of having healthy animals and also having a really wonderful Uh, experience in being a goat herder. It's a fabulous way to live life, to share with these animals. They're highly intelligent. They, um, They love to walk with humans. They love to interact with humans. And I think they give back far more than, um, than we really need. And I, I feel so happy every day that it's not snowing up to my hips, uh, that, um, that I am a goat herder and that I chose this way of life. Okay, well, with that, I'll remind you that you've been listening to When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine with Jay and Annie Warmke, Annie the Goat Herder Warmke, thanking you for spending just a wee little bit of time with us. And as your grandmother hopefully probably told you and the goats, the secret to a happy and sustainable life is... Play nice with others, clean up your own mess, and Jay, you and the goats really do need to eat a lot more vegetables. We are foragers. Okay, till next time. Mother Earth will sing and her children will be
You can find more information on living sustainably in our unsustainable world at blueRockstation.com. Mm-hmm.